Welcome to another edition of the Black Writers' Corner. Today I will be talking about the second James Baldwin book I have read, which is The Fire Next Time. This book is a collection of essays, or two essays to be specific. Overall, I thought that this was an incredible book and a book that I really wish that I had read when I was younger and people weren't really having these conversations as much as they were now. The first essay is a letter which Baldwin writes to his nephew. So in it he talks about his own father who he describes as defeated because at the bottom of his heart he really believed what white people said about him. And I think I'm glad that I read this after watching, after reading Another Country because I definitely see parallels in the way he talks about his own struggles and his father's struggles in terms in relation to Rufus's character. So in it he recognises and acknowledges the importance of recognising and acknowledging the past in order to understand the present and why things are the way they are today. He uses the collective pain and suffering in his brother's history and his brother's story to call out white people for refusing to acknowledge and recognise the influence of the oppression in America's past. He says that it is by ignoring history that injustice is continued to... is continued. In the novel he tells his nephew that you were born where you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. He goes on to say that you were born in a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Here he tells his nephew the stark reality of life for a black man or for a black person growing up in the US. That everything he did and everything that he would do was constituted by his race. One of the most important things that I took away from this letter was that white people see themselves in opposition to black people and it is only by seeing black people as lesser beings and subjugated in the way they are that white people are able to love themselves, that they need somebody to feel better than, to be able to face the reality of who they are. Um, so I'll just quote, I'll do another quote here. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them. And I mean that very seriously. You must accept them and accept them with love. They have had to behave and to believe for many years that, and for innumerable reasons, that black men are inferior to white men. So here he's saying that for so long, white people have had to live in a world where black people are have been at the bottom and to suddenly change this ideology is comparable to shaking heaven, the heavens and the earth to their foundations. He's saying that it isn't something that's going to happen overnight and to change somebody's ideology like that is a huge thing. By humanising black people, white people will be losing a sense of who they are and will have to figure that out and re re-piece together what that is. In the end, James tells his nephew to sit tight and he tells him that, you know, he's come from generations of strong and um, capable people who have enjoyed the worst and that he too can enjoy just like they did. The second essay shows Baldwin talking about his experience with the church in the context of America's race relations. So he starts off by talking about how he saw the pimps and the prostitutes and all this kind of crazy business going on in the streets and he was scared that that was going to be him. So he talks about how every black person has to find a gimmick or a thing to bring them out of um, violence or a life of crime or a life on the streets. Something to catapult them, you know, out of that. And he sought refuge in the church. One of the most illuminating quotes I found in this was, white people in this country will have quite enough to do in learning how to accept and love themselves and each other. When they have achieved this, the Negro problem will no longer exist. 
I love this passage because this is exactly the right way to frame the conversation. Too often I see race being portrayed as a black problem. I see people and my friends and other white people coming to me and saying, how do I, you know, how do I fix racism? How do I stop myself being more racist? And I think that frames it as a black problem and it's not a problem with the black community. We're not the racist ones, if you know what I mean. And the way that it's talked about in, in the media and just in general, I think race is seen as a black problem and it's seen as something that black people have to fix when it is, it's got nothing to do with us and we're not the ones who created it. It's not a problem that we can solve because it's not a problem with us. This essay kind of echoes what he was saying in the previous one. He talks about how white identity was based on the inferiority of black people and so white people set up a society where black people were doomed to fail and couldn't rise so that they could assert themselves as superior and they could make feel a little bit better about themselves and so that black people could stay confined to the stereotypes that white people so neatly laid out for them and this was all to to maintain the status quo and to maintain the hegemony. Something else I really liked that he talked about in this was the hypocrisy of the church. He calls out how, you know, the church and Christianity says that, you know, you have to treat people the way that you want to be treated, yet white people do definitely and certainly do not treat black people the way that they would like to be treated. And I will cite another quote here. He says, I really mean there was no love in the church. It was a mask for hatred and self-hatred and despair. The transforming power of the Holy Ghost ended when the service ended. Salvation stopped at the church door. The passion which with we loved the Lord was a measure of how deeply we feared and distrusted and in the end hated almost all strangers and avoided and despised ourselves. I liked this quote because I think that it talked about how we use the church and we use Christianity to escape how we feel about ourselves and so often we see people in the church who are meant to be these pious holier than holier people holier than holy people which Baldwin talks about with you know how Germany was considered a Christian nation yet they still did the Holocaust which I just thought was so so powerful um, another thing he says is the spreading of the gospel regales of the motives or the integrity or the heroism of some of the missionaries was an absolutely indispensable justification for the planting of the flag. I really liked how he called out the Christian church in terms of I don't sometimes I don't understand how black people can be so embroiled with the church and with Christianity when it was a religion that was used to subjugate them during slavery. It was a religion used to justify why they should be slaves and why they were lower than white people and how time and time again the church has been shown to treat um, women disgustingly, terribly. It has been shown to justify um, violence and Britain, sorry, America and a lot of the powers in the world, their, their colonial pasts and the suffering caused by their conquest and how it's also being used to start the, the non-violence movement um, even though the legacy of America and the legacy of colonialism in, in America's empire and Britain's empire is one of violence yet when black people are trying to advocate for their rights suddenly the, they stand up and hide behind their Bibles and start perpetuating this idea of non-violence and it's what Martin Luther King would, would have wanted and it's the Christian thing to do when their legacy of Christianity has been nothing but genocide and slaughter and for them to turn around and use the Bible in this way and for to expect black people to get behind the Bible after what it has been used to do and what it is being used to justify, sometimes I just can't, I can't get around that, I can't get behind that, it doesn't add up for me in my head. And I was raised a Christian, I was raised a Catholic, I've been to Baptist church, I've been to Christian church, I've been to Pentecostal church, is I've had every, every opportunity to have been absorbed into the church, but something for me just hasn't added up about it. 
what they say about women, you know, the legacy of the Crusades, the legacy of violence, it just doesn't align for me and I can't bring myself to accept a religion that was used to justify such terrible things being done to people like me. It, it was really interesting for me to see the really kind of bizarre meeting with Elijah Muhammad, um, one of the leading figures in the Nation of Islam, because um, I didn't really know a lot about Islam in a black context. Um, I know a lot about it in terms of in a Middle Eastern context, but I'd never really heard anything about it in a black context. So it was interesting for me to to kind of perceive the idea of a black god, um, especially in a culture that very much promotes images of a white, a blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus when Jesus was from the Middle East, which makes no sense. And even though in the Bible he, just, he was described as copper skinned with woolen hair and I don't know what white people have woolen hair but okay he he admired the movement because he was um he was listening to somebody talk um at a pulpit at a pulpit and he was struck and really taken aback by the power that the the person's words were having on the black people at the time um and he was just like shook basically that the police weren't beating the shit out of everybody and beating the shit out of the person that was talking as usual. And he felt that the person's words had a really strong impact on black people and was kind of like waking them up. And he attributed this to the Christian church being proving time and time again that they are morally bankrupt. And back when you know, colonizers and Christians went into black nations or nations with indigenous people under the guise of Christianity and trying to spread the word of Christianity and subjugated these people and subjugated these cultures. It was impossible to believe in the idea of a black God. But now that the Christian church has shown itself to be morally bankrupt time and time again with the Holocaust, what happened in Germany and, you know, with the child sex abuse scandals, it became a lot easier for black people to be able to digest the idea of a black god and over time black people have become more malleable to the idea of black god which i found really interesting that you know their the islam is with with a black god is being promoted in america i thought that was mind blowing i think overall this is a really this is an amazing book and it, it's sad to me that something that was written in 1963 is still so relevant now and we're still having these same conversations and we're still trying to get people to understand these same things. There's a lot of ideas here that feel very new and feel very current and it was really shocking for me to learn that they were, you know, they came from 1963. Um, I would recommend everybody reading this book I think it is a really important book and a lot of the things that are being said in this book are very applicable and relatable to what's going on today. With this review I didn't want to just summarize the novel I wanted to just pull out parts that I thought were interesting that I wanted to talk about and have a discussion about. I feel like this is very much a book that you have to explore by yourself and and go on a journey through yourself and I don't want to ruin that experience for you. I've pulled out the things that that were most interesting to me. There are, there's a lot of stuff that I haven't discussed but I think that's part of the fun and I look forward to hearing what you think and your own thoughts on the novel or just on some of the things that I said. Do great things. See you in my next video.